Perfect. Uh, good evening, brothers. Um, my name is Dionysius Protopapadakis, Director of Graduate Engagement for Phi Gamma Delta. Um, with us tonight, we have uh, Adam Guy, President of Upper Crust Food Services, and Shana Smith, Director of Strategic Partnerships, um, touching on the topic of kitchen and meal trends. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and for brothers that will be watching this at a later time, uh, thank you all for taking the time to view this webinar. Adam and Shana, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, um, Dio. We appreciate it. And uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity to present this webinar today. Uh, as he said, my name is Adam Guy. I am the president uh, of Upper Crust Food Service. And then uh, we also have with us uh, Shanna Smith. Uh, she is our director of strategic partnerships. And as many of you know, uh, Upper Crust Food Service, we are the uh, preferred food service vendor. Uh, for Fiji, and so that is part of Shanna's role with our company is to manage that relationship. Um, and so uh, we're we're very excited and and proud to to be partners and and to hopefully be a resource uh, for everybody uh, on this call when they need things that are food service related. Um, I'm going to go through the agenda here real quick of what we plan to uh, cover for today's uh, webinar. And uh, we will, of course, be open for questions at the end of the webinar. And we welcome you and uh, to, to join us for that and ask us any questions that you may have. Um, the first uh, question uh, or topic that we're going to be covering is uh, some, of the to some of the ideas of why we should consider uh, switching to a food service company versus being independent. Um, and so we're going to go through and kind of talk about that, especially uh, as some of the COVID-19 uh, uh, issues are arising and, and some of the liabilities that can be taken off there. We're going to discuss the Generation Z student of today. Um, and Generation Z is the students that we have in our houses right now. Uh, we do a lot of research at our company on this group um, uh, and this generation because they are our students. They're the ones that ultimately are our customers and, and who we have to keep happy. As corporation boards, um, you, you have the same tall task that we do uh, to keep your students that are Generation Z students happy. And so we believe that learning a little bit more about them sometimes helps us to understand them better uh, and be able to give them what they're looking for. Uh, we're also gonna look at um, some, some traits uh, of the Generation Z students. Um, and then we're going to go through kind of some of the trends and some of the fads uh, of food service right now for, for going into 2020. Uh, we're then going to end the presentation today by talking about some of the suggested uh, best food service practices in this post-COVID-19 environment, uh, which I'm sure is a, a hot button item and, and, and ticket for everybody right now. So let's go ahead and push forward into the webinar since we have so much to cover today. We're going to start with uh, some of the benefits of, of considering moving to a food service company from, from being independent. Uh, there's many of you on this call probably who uh, run a wonderful independent kitchen, uh, and maybe you've been able to do that successfully for years, and that's awesome. Uh, the reality is that uh, these kitchens, we're running little mini restaurants. Uh, in some cases, we're running restaurants that are busier than some of your uh, restaurants that are open establishments to the public, uh, serving three meals a day, uh, 15 to 20 meals a week. Um, and this is a busy place and there's a lot of moving parts. And as we all know, uh, anyone who has a friend in the restaurant business can tell you that the restaurant business is hard. And so as a food service company, this is what we live and breathe. This is all we do is, is food service management. So one of the first things that, that really uh, helps and that's something to consider uh, when thinking about a food service company is the staff stability. Um, oftentimes we find that, that clients uh, get, um, they kind of get handcuffed a bit by the staff that they choose. So you make a choice at the beginning of the school year for a chef, and then you find out partway through the school year that that chef is not a good fit for your house. But the idea of having to replace them midstream and potentially hiring someone who might be even worse than your current chef uh, is a daunting task. And so oftentimes we're forced as an independent operator to kind of kick the can down the road, try to finish off the school year and then regroup for the following year. What's nice about a food service company is that we have training chefs, regional directors, people that are in place where we can make changes in staffing very quickly. Uh, obviously it's our goal to um, 
get the right fit the first time. But if there ever is an issue where there a change needs to be made, we're able to do that quickly. Uh, sometimes even within you know 24 hours, um, if if we have to. Uh, and so that, that having that stability and knowing that you're always going to have a trained chef in your kitchen, even if it's one of our training chefs for a short period of time, uh, I think is a big benefit. The budget certainty, uh, that's certainly something going into this post-COVID world, uh, I think that um, is going to be very important for us to consider is that, uh, you know, when you sign a contract with a food service company, that is your price. Uh, the price that you sign the contract for is the price you will pay. So we don't have to worry about it when everybody makes a run on beef and the beef prices go up. Uh, that's your food service company's problem and not yours. Um, and uh, when you're, you know, when your chef asks for a raise um, or when, you know, things increase in price, uh, you don't have to worry about these things anymore. These are things that give you the budget certainty to set your budget uh, and be able to kind of forget about that part, uh, that line item uh, from a planning standpoint. The liability, um, oftentimes people say, what is the one number one thing? Uh, that a reason a reason to switch to a food service company and and my mind always takes me back to this liability um, the fact that we employ a, all of the the staff that we take care of workers compensation insurance uh, the fact that we take care of their medical benefits um, the fact that we take out an additional uh, insurance policy and list your property address as additionally insured uh, just in case, you know, knock on wood that, that something were to happen, that our insurance policy would, would kick in before yours. And so this, this idea of liability, especially in an ever-increasing, um, I, I think that litigation is ever-increasing, uh, you know, workplace uh, issues and things of that nature, uh, people are just really quick to pull the trigger uh, on on that type of thing. And so having that liability be 100% on your food service company and off of your shoulders is certainly a benefit. As we continue to, to move on here, uh, obviously having awesome food, uh, that, can be, that can be accomplished independently as well. I think the biggest issue um, with trying to maintain awesome food is how do you continue to keep your independent chef motivated? Um, if you pick the right person who's self-motivated, then you're probably going to be in good luck. Someone who can come into work every day, be excited about what they're doing, uh, not require anybody to be overseeing them and to do a great job. But the reality in this day and age is that most employees uh, need some guidance uh, and they want guidance um, and they want to have uh, rules to follow. They want to have policies and procedures in place and they want to have that support. And so for us to accomplish awesome food, uh, we have policies in place to make sure that our chefs are uh, living up to what we're selling uh, and living up to the expectations uh, of your men. I think that one thing that we can all agree on is that students today have higher expectations than students of the past. So I like to tell a story when I was uh, in my fraternity, um, we used to take our knife and scrape the gravy off the top of the meat. And we would get really excited if we could tell if it was pork or chicken. Um, if we knew what kind of meat it was that we were eating, that was a, that was a great night for us. And that type of thing just isn't acceptable anymore. Um, you know, students um, have parents who have taken them out to nice restaurants and they have uh, seen traveled the world in often cases. Um, they've they've seen a lot of things. They've tasted a lot of good food. And so that expectation um, of that that really awesome food is there. And I think that some of the stories we hear sometimes as corporation board members, we say, oh, well, you know, back in the day, uh, we were fine with that. Well, that that is true. But the reality is, is that in today's day and age, the students expect awesome food and they expect it to be creative with with way more variety than maybe most of us expected when we were in college. The communication piece is another thing. Um, when adding a food service company, you add that that sense of communication. Um, where you have access, you have direct access to managers, to uh, folks that take care of billing, uh, operations teams. Uh, in your case, you have direct access to Shanna, the Director of Strategic Partnerships for, for Fiji. Um, and then for all of our customers, they have direct access to me as the president of the company. But this communication and this ability to be able to solve problems quickly, uh, we never claim to be perfect. Uh, and I think that anyone who says they can come and run your kitchen and be perfect is is probably not selling you a bill of goods that that is accurate. But what we can claim to do is we can try to be perfect every day. And if there ever is a problem through communication and being a great partner, we can fix those things quickly. 
And I think that's something we take pride in. Um, we're going to hit on more of this cutting edge stuff later in the presentation as we talk about how we interact with Generation Z. But staying on the cutting edge of technology is important. Um, and it's important because the students are communicating that way. And so with us, we have, um, we have our app, which we'll talk more about later, and also just doing things like chapter surveys that go through email, um, hitting these guys and in in communicating with them in a way that is appropriate and makes sense to them, I think is very, very, very important. See if we can get the next slide here. There we go. Um, lastly, I think for us is we've really worked hard over the last 10 years uh, to try to become the industry leader. Um, and that, that's what we strive for. Uh, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, and, and as an entrepreneur, um, I, I love this industry because this is a niche industry. I've been in the restaurant industry before. As you guys know, there's, there's more chairs and restaurants than we really need. Uh, the competition is fierce. Um, and it's not that competition isn't fierce here, but what's nice about this is that this is a niche industry. And what we can do as opposed to going out and competing with hundreds of thousands of restaurants with a similar concept, uh, we can really focus in and hone in on being the very best at this niche, serving fraternity men. Um, and that's that's really what we what we have done and, and tried to do well. And so uh, our goal and our mission statement is to exceed our customers' expectations. Um, and if we can do that, then we're going to continue to be successful. And and so these are just some of the reasons we think that that considering moving to a food service company might be something that that would be uh, a good idea. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay. So I'm going to take over and. Um, talk about today's student and the, per, the young men that we're dealing with. Um, so the college student of today, they were born between 1995 and 2010. Um, they first entered college in 2013. Um, they are going to be a more ethnically diverse group um, than any others that we have dealt with. Um, they've been raised by Gen X parents. Um, for some of you, you're thinking, ooh, could be good or bad. And it depends on those parents. Um, they make up 24.3% of the population. And by the end of 2020, end of this year, um, their population is going to be 2.56 billion. Um, this uh, one of five Americans belong to Gen Z. So um, I'm just going to say we have to embrace them. Um, they are a very um, unique group, but a fun group. Um, so just a, some real quick facts. Um, Gen Z and how they deal with the economy, um, they are um, on average receiving $16.90 per week um, or uh, $44 billion a year total. 58% um, of them are either somewhat or very worried about the future. I'm sure this is with the post-COVID has increased uh, significantly. Um, they have a combined buying, buying power of 43 billion and influence an additional 600 billion of their family spending. Um, my guess is that number's probably increased since they've been home for such a time right now. 77% um, of them believe they will need to work harder compared to past generations to have a satisfying and fulfilling professional life. A third of them would like to retire by the age of 60, but only 17% of them think that's gonna be possible. Um, their values, 77% uh, are extremely interested in volunteering. Um, you may have seen that this is a group from a chapter level that um, likes to volunteer, does more, um, community events, that type of thing. That's part of it is they are geared to this way. 79% um, display symptoms of emotional distress when kept away from their personal electronic devices. Um, just if you ever want to see how that works, just say to them, we are going to do this dinner or this lunch as a electronic free. and Please place your devices in this basket. None of them will go. Um, 90 percent would be upset with no internet while only 15 51 percent would give up eating out um, 60 percent of them say a lot of money is a sign of success um, 
The other part on this is they uh, multitask and do a lot of things while they are watching TV and when you think they are not paying attention, however they are. Um, as employees, if any of you are employing a Gen Z, 17% of them want to start their own, um, start a business and hire others. Um, their expectation is they're only gonna work at four companies throughout their lifetime. Um, so they are the type of employee that you are gonna have some longevity to um, because they're not looking to make a lot of changes. 45% um, um, cite potential challenges working with baby boomers compared to 17% who anticipate difficulties with Gen X and 5% with millennials. 81% um, of them aspire to be leaders. So from a fraternal world, this is phenomenal um, because we've all struggled, I'm sure at times where who's gonna be the next president, who, who are we gonna find that's gonna be the next treasurer. You have a great group of young men that want to be leaders. So I think this is um, very exciting in our fraternal world. As consumers, um, they like to spend money, 36, percent on food and drink, 32% going out with friends, and 18% on clothes. 64% uh, of them trust content on mobile apps as well as uh, text messages. 50% of them will look for their on their phone for a better price while shopping at a retail store. Um, I am not in that millennial world, however, I have now found myself doing more of that too. Um, I think this is interesting. 64% say their parents pay for them with their credit or debit card. So they are still um, very dependent um, on their parents for college, uh, fraternity, um, food, drink, clothing, et cetera. Um, so, you know, they will um, look online to buy as much as they can. Um, and are probably teaching um, some of their parents or grandparents during this COVID of shopping at shopping at home. Um, as investors, they would rather save money than spend it at 57%. Um, on spending, they spend 76% on themselves, 38% on things for family and friends, and 10% giving to a charity. Um, their goals are 33% paying for an education or for buying a car, 23% paying, paying for an education, and only 20% buying a house. The Gen Z's owning a home is not what it meant to the baby boomers, et cetera. So seeing a change in that. Um, as students, 50% um, will be university educated compared to 33% of millennials and 25% of Gen X. I think this, especially during this COVID time, is a real positive because they want to come back to school. Um, they are going to want that education. They are not going to want to do everything online. Um, so this, is, I think, is a real plus for all of us. 64% um, consider earning an advanced degree as one of their life goals. 80% um, think they're more driven than their peers, so they are a very competitive group. 30% um, feel that college has failed at teaching them applicable real life business skills. And I think that is also where we see some of those people then going to a technology or trade school. Um, you know, you, for some of us, you know, you had a business or a life class that was, you know, an age myself, you know, how to write a check, how to balance your checkbook and that kind of piece um, with everything being done on the phone, some of those things, um, real life business skills have not happened. So Gen Z and their food preferences. So here is where they get, uh, where we come into play is, you know, they're relying on the basics and then they wanna add variety. Um, they're willing to try something new and unique. Um, as Adam said earlier, you know, their parents have exposed them to a tremendous amount of, you know, food variety. Um, but don't shun the shun the classics. They still like good macaroni and cheese. If it's 
the best meatloaf they've ever had, they're going for meatloaf. Uh, fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy. They do like the classics. Um, but you need to make the menu speak their language. Um, we found out a few years ago, we put on a menu pot roast. For a lot of us, we all know what that means. We had so many questions and people going, I don't think I'm going to eat that night because I don't know what this is. So now we're like, it's a beef pot roast or a pork roast, um, something that, you know, is explaining what the food is to them. And then really thinking about the drinks. Um, they like soda um, or pop, depends on the area you're at. Um, and they order it frequently, but they also like lemonade, flavored waters, fruit juice, smoothies. So, um, you know, they will not just kind of stay with some of the standards um, on that. Okay, let me see since I got to get the slide. So snacking. Um, this is probably one that we have seen grow in our proposals is providing additional snacks. So they approach snack foods very differently. 90% of consumers snack um, multiple times a day. It increases as Gen Z ages. Um, snacking is an extension of who they are. They do it at a rate of 53 times more per capita basis annually than any other generation. Um, they will snack for them. If you offered a meal plan that basically put food out 24 seven, they would love it. It'd be hard for us to employ that way and it would cost you and passing along to them the cost, but they will eat nonstop. And it's not just a handful of peanuts or something like that. They're wanting to make a sandwich. Is it a smoothie? Um, what kind of multiple bagged, individually bagged products can I get? Um, you know, you know, are there going to be frozen burritos that I can reheat in the microwave, et cetera? Um, so three trends that we are going to explore um, today in regards to their Gen Z traits or food trends dietary trends and technologically technology trends. And I'm gonna let Adam um, take the first one at food trends. All right, thank you, Shanna. Um, so what we wanna start by talking about is what is the difference between a trend and a fad? Uh, I think sometimes we get these confused. Uh, so if we just go to the dictionary, uh, it'll tell us that a fad is a practice or interest followed for a time uh, with exaggerated zeal, and a trend is a prevailing tendency or inclination, a general movement over time um, of a statistically detectable change. So essentially what we're saying the difference here is, is that a trend is something that sticks, right? Uh, becomes something that becomes mainstream, and a fad is something that is a kind of a short-term pop of popularity. I'm gonna give you some examples here uh, of the difference between a trend and a fad. Uh, what you see here, uh, this is a fad. Um, I actually think we might have somebody on the call today, one of our clients who, who worked for Starbucks, so he would be familiar with this. Uh, but the unicorn frappuccino, uh, this was on the Starbucks menu, I believe, for about five days. Um, it was a huge fad. It was a, it was a, people were clamoring to go get this unicorn frappuccino, uh, but it wasn't something that stuck on the menu and became a trend that everybody had to have long term. Uh, but it was a great marketing uh, deal and a, and a fad for them. Something that's on the flip side of that that we would see as more of a trend that kind of stuck in long term is the idea of having this no sugar added. Um, so consumers looking for products with no added sugars was something that um, maybe was a fad to start with, but kind of became a trend and is now here to stay for at least the foreseeable future. So as we look um, at the idea of fads and trends, fads can become trends. And sometimes it's hard to determine if they're going to or not. Uh, but I'll give you an example of one um, that that is becoming a trend right now as it continues to be popular is avocado toast. So avocado toast was one of our top sort of fads of 2019 
but it has stayed popular. Now, for those that are listening to this on the fraternity world, it might not be quite as popular as our uh, sorority clients, but the fact of the matter is, is that avocado toast is still one of our top breakfast items in our sorority houses. And so it's trending, uh, you know, or it's going to be more of a trend, we believe, than a fad as it's uh, remaining high in its popularity. So one thing that's interesting is we are a nationwide company now, um, and we work in, in, in all of these states from coast to coast, is that it's really interesting for our chefs to be looking, and for us menu-wise, to be seeing where the trends and fads move. So generally speaking, for the most part, we see trends that move from the coast inward towards the Midwest. Um, and so as we see menus that get submitted and approved across the country from our chefs, We'll find items that um, will start, let's say, in Washington, Colorado, um, New York, uh, areas areas like that, and we'll see these new menu items that all of a sudden are popping up on chefs' menus that are being requested from the men and women in the houses. And then slowly and sh slowly but surely, we'll see those items creep into the SEC and into the Midwest. Um, and it's just been a really interesting to see to see that happen. Oftentimes, uh, I'm based in Missouri, oftentimes by the time that we start uh, producing those trends or those fads in, in Missouri, then the coasts are on to something else. So, um, you know, you'll notice uh, one thing is like gluten-free diets. Um, you know, those were real big on the coast. They moved into the Midwest. And now we're seeing that those are less popular on the coast and still popular um, in, in the Midwest. So we're going to look here at some of the top college trends for 2020. These are some of the things that we're seeing uh, that are going on menus and things that our chefs uh, are looking at when we're putting things together. And even if you're independent, we hope you get some great information out of this that maybe you can use on, on your menus. So the idea of these plant-based options, uh, this is a big deal. Um, they, the students are liking food that supports healthier environments, healthy diets. Um, so having a few plant-based options that are thrown out there here and there, um, making vegetables, instead of just making vegetables real plain and throwing them out, if you can make vegetables kind of become the star of the show, um, something that's real unique and different and neat, uh, students will eat them. Um, and, and so they, they like the flavors, they like the colors, um, and, and they like it when things that are, that are um, plant-based become the entree sometimes. And you can't do that one all the time because we know our fraternity men like their like their traditional proteins as well. Uh, the global flavors, we kind of touched on this already. Uh, the world's becoming a smaller place when it comes to flavor palettes uh, because people have access to more foods. There's more variety of restaurants in, in all of our local communities. And so um, we have to be able to bring these global flavors into uh, into the kitchens of our fraternity houses. And the good news is, is that they're generally accepted. Even if it's something that a student hasn't tried before, this Generation Z is willing to, to grasp onto that and, and willing to accept that. Bowls. Uh, the idea of bowls is becoming more and more popular. Um, and this really comes down to customization. Um, which I think we're going to cover as well. But the idea of the bowl is that, you know, you can start with a base ingredient and then you can add all different kinds of ingredients into your bowl. What's awesome about this is they're making their own dish. And so the end result is something that they love. Um, and so these power bowls, um, all different kinds, we probably have about 15 or 20 different bowls uh, that our chefs create across the country. And as we look at reviews that come in from our app, anytime that we do bowls, um, the, the students love them. It's, it's five stars across the board for that type of menu item. So kind of transitioning into that crazy for customization, um, this is going to be something that's going to be, I think, a struggle uh, for everyone as we uh, look at this post-COVID world and, and what the rules are going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. Our students love customization. Uh, they love to be able to customize their plate, make what they want. When you look at the restaurants that are popular, you're seeing a little bit of a decline in restaurants that are fine dining, restaurants that are uh, your kind of your traditional dining model. Even your casual restaurants that are sit downs like your Applebee's, Ruby Tuesdays, you know, places like that that used to be the staple go to uh, back when I was a kid 
are, are now kind of lacking in popularity. And in their place are places like Chipotle, uh, places where you can go and, and build your own. This sort of fast casual is what we call that. And so because these students in Generation Z grew up with this ability to customize every time they went out to a restaurant, uh, they expect that from us too in the, frater in the fraternity world. And so this is something I think that um, is gonna be here to stay. And it's gonna be a tall task for us to all put our heads together and figure out how do we continue to provide that customized experience in this post COVID environment um, if some of our buffets and stuff are limited. Avoiding allergens, uh, this is a big deal. Um, it's a bigger deal in our sororities than it is in our fraternities, but we're finding it more and more prevalent now in our fraternities as well. Uh, people are more aware uh, of what they're allergic to, what their preferences are, um, and so the, that's becoming a really big deal uh, for people to be able to uh, tell us about those things and for us to be able to make meals that, that fit their needs. And so things like shellfish, wheat, dairy, eggs, milk, tree nuts, um, it's more important than ever that your staff knows about those types of allergens and um, how to prepare dishes without those if you have a student in your house that needs that. And so it's all about communication when it comes to uh, special diets. Um, and so encouraging that is really, really important. Uh, we've touched on snacks and it, it continues to be a trend of 2020, which is 24 seven snacks. Um, not every group can afford this and it's okay if you can't. Uh, but for some groups, uh, they're looking at adding a snack budget. And what we normally do for groups on snack budget is we take a certain dollar amount per week so that it doesn't become a cost prohibitive item. So I'm just going to throw this out there. But if you if you planned on, let's say, a dollar a day per in-house member. So if you had, you know, 50 in-house members, then maybe your budget might be $250 a week uh, for snacks. And then what the food service company does is that we basically purchase up to that $250 in packaged snacks. Um, and then that way we don't ever go over your budget. But you always wanna make sure you work that in from the beginning uh, when you're working out your costs per person per semester. Action stations. Um, I can see action stations becoming even more popular um, in the post-COVID environment because uh, these are a, a safe way to produce food. Uh, it's also an exciting way to produce food. So having your chef step outside of the kitchen, um, doing grill outs, um, you know, doing something special on the grill like that. Uh, the middle picture there you see is a pasta action station where we have all different kinds of toppings that can be thrown in. In this case, students wouldn't have to touch any utensils. Staff can make this. It becomes a little bit of a show. Um, obviously, if you have a really large chapter of, let's say, 100 plus members on a meal plan, you have to do these in special ways to get everybody through the line. But oftentimes in some of our uh, mid to smaller chapters, uh, you can substitute a meal with an action station. Um, and it's just kind of a cool, exciting, different way to look at dinner that breaks the monotony of going through the same motions that they do every single day. Well, I'm gonna uh, take it from here. We're gonna talk a little on the dietary trends that are happening. So the dietary landscape is quickly morphing. More and more individuals are choosing to remove certain foods from their daily consumptions due to habits, consumption habits due to tolerance, allergies, doctor's orders, or personal preference. Food allergies in particular are a concern to parents and students who are often away from home for the first time and making those decisions for the first time in their life. Um, so we have some people that, you know, mom and dad, made sure that nothing in their house um, you know had tree nuts if they were allergic to that and now they're being put into this large uh, community um, where they're having to think for that themselves gen z will this is a very sad statistic um, gen z is going to be the first generation to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents due to unprecedented childhood childhood obesity rates um, Gen Z's glutton goals have been a long time in the making. Um, they're educated about what goes into food and drinks, but they choose um, their indulgent options anyway. Um, they um, 
only 32% are making an effort to eat healthier. Um, however, 25% of them think bottled soda or pop is um, as bad as cigarettes. Most common allergies today, they refer to these as the big eight. And you've got shelf, kind of starting at the top uh, left, you've got shellfish, tree nuts, fish, dairy, soy, gluten, eggs, and peanut. Um, the tree nuts and peanuts um, make up 80% of the allergies. So how to handle dietary requests. This is one that um, we get asked quite a bit and we will do whatever you as our client customer want us to do. So if you have a policy, we would say you need to stick to it and let us know what that is. Um, do you require a doctor's note? Um, we all kind of know that uh, for any kind of dollar amount, you could probably get a doctor to write you anything. Um, what we do ask is if you have students that have dietary needs, we'd love for them to meet with the chef. Um, because the questions we're gonna ask is, you know, what are, what are your allergies, your dietary needs? And then it's really the, what do you like to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, what foods do you like and dislike? If somebody's allergic to peanuts, we already know they can't have peanuts, but what the chef wants to know is, what are, what are the things that you like? Um, and then how long have you lived with this diagnosis or diet? And then what are your biggest challenges on this? Um, we had a co-ed fraternity um, that had somebody living in that was allergic um, to peanuts and hers was airborne. And so, you know, one of the things I sat down with the chapter officers and said, you know, we can't have peanut butter in this house at all or, you know, um, on that. And they were like, well, can we have it in our room? And I was like, no. I said, you guys, this is airborne. This is, this is the big time. I said, so all of you need to support her and knowing that, you know, this, you know, is kind of very deadly to her. And so it took some education, but, you know, they all were kind of like, okay, I guess we can do this. I said, you know, eat your peanut butter on campus if that's what you're going to do. Um, the tough reality um, on dealing with Gen Z food preferences, I think this quote is so perfect. Um, there's a lot of different types of eating, but what is interesting, it's whether it's Gen Z, boomers, Gen X, or millennials, they may avoid dairy in the morning. By afternoon, they're going to try something vegetarian, and then all of a sudden they're paleo by dinner time. Uh, we don't see consumers sticking to any one particular way of eating for very long. They are continually customizing bits and pieces from each one of these different ways of eating. You know, it may be it may be too local, it may be gluten-free for the moment. I'm sure all of you have or been around somebody that says I'm gluten-free, and then you may just see them, you know, later on that evening they've had a beer and you in your mind you're trying to kind of put everything together on that. So just know they are experimenting and they are going to try um, different things. So, um, you know, from a chef's standpoint, you know, they're very concerned about what the allergens are. Um, going paleo to vegetarian at a meal is something they're just experimenting with. And so Adam, we'll let you go technology and food. Sure. So the technology and food, kind of going back to those first few slides, when we talked about the cutting edge um, technology and what these students expect, um, you know, the students in Generation Z, they live through continuous updates. I think all of us can agree that we see them on their phone, you know, 24 seven, right? They always have it with them. Uh, they process information faster than any other generation, thanks to their apps like Snapchat and Vine. Uh, their attention span is six seconds. That probably surprises nobody on this call. 
uh, and it's significantly lower than the millennials, which actually were able to listen to us all for 12 seconds. So we've lost uh, we've lost half of our ability uh, to to listen um, and, and and to have attention span. Um, but they're very savvy. Uh, they shy away. They're shying away from Facebook a little bit now. Uh, they 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 move kind of from app to app, but they focus more right now on Instagram, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Tumblr, um, and they're likely. Uh, live blogging, live tweeting. Uh, we we find that our food pictures end up all over the internet uh, from people who who love their meals and and then actually become a marketing tool for us. In many cases, people will see the food and say, "Hey, who who cooked that? We need that food at our house." So, how we work with Generation Z on technology? Um, first of all, our students uh, can download our app. Uh, we, we've made this app from the ground up. Uh, we own all the code uh, inside of here. So it's a very unique situation where we can ebb and flow and create different things with our app at any time. Uh, with the COVID environment, we've already got some updates that we're thinking about adding to make life easier post COVID. Uh, but they start by creating a profile, uh, which is where they tell us about any allergies or dietary preferences that they have. And this profile follows them throughout the app as they use it. Um, this allows us to get feedback from our students, which allows us to get uh, flavor profiles from them by regions, campuses, chapters. Uh, what's really awesome about this is that it's real data uh, that we can use as opposed to just saying, oh, it, you know, it seems like they really like this at Alabama, or it seems like they really like this in New York or Missouri. Um, no, we can actually tell you exactly what they like in those areas because we have the raw data to show it. They can sign up for their late plates, uh, which is huge. Uh, they can crave food, which means when they tell us what their craves are, then we add those to the menu, to future menus, so that there really is that back and forth relationship where they know that we're listening to them, that we care about what they want. Uh, they have the ability to rate the meals, uh, to basically give us feedback. Uh, when we first started the app, we thought this would be nothing but negative, right? That people would only tell us when they were upset. The reality is, is that we received hundreds and hundreds of thousands of reviews uh, last school year, and our average was about 4.5 out of five stars. So what we're finding is the students are telling us what they love because they want to make sure they get those things on their menu again, uh, which has been a really great trait. Uh, we currently have over 13,000 active uh, app users um, using our app, and we're constantly updating that. So. Um, it's just a great way for us to kind of communicate on their level. So uh, we're going to finish off the presentation today uh, kind of with one of the bigger ticket items, which is some of the potential food service changes we may see in this post-COVID environment. Um, one of the biggest question marks is, is the buffet service going to be eliminated? Uh, Self-service buffets and salad bars may no longer be approved. Um, I want to tell you something in the way that we're handling this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take this uh, on a house by house basis. And what we mean by that is that we don't think it's appropriate for us as a company to create policy uh, that is going to blanket the entire United States, because how the health department in New York is going to view this may be very different than how the health department in Idaho or in Wyoming or Utah or uh, Colorado are going to uh, look at this. So what we decided to do as a company is we're gonna look at the local health department and or university regulations, uh, and, and we're going to base the baseline there. So as a food service company, we will make sure that your operation is fulfilling all of the requirements of the local health department. Then we will have, uh, we have a list of resources uh, of these potential food service changes or best practices, we're going to allow our customers then to let us know, do they want to go above and beyond? Do they want to stay with the required regulations? So all of that, that's how we're handling the situation. So when it comes to the buffet, some of the alternatives, if your health department says no buffet, uh, would be st uh, staffing the buffet service. So what this would look like is our staff would be on one side of the buffet or uh, handing plates, uh, creating plates, and then handing them back to your students. So if you don't have a double-sided buffet, your students would wait at the end of the buffet, we would build their plate, hand it to them based on what they wanted, and it becomes, for backup, lack of better terms, almost like a lunch lady from elementary school type of situation. Um, the real reason people are concerned about the buffet 
is they're worried about the contamination of the utensils. Um, this would also allow us to monitor the social distancing at the buffet lines. So that's one alternative. The second alternative um, to the buffet line is going to be individually packaging um, meals into individual containers. So you can see some photos on this slide of that's what we had to do at the end of the school year at many of our universities as we closed things down, uh, we were mandated to do that. So we can still put out quality food, uh, it just goes into boxes. Uh, this is one uh, item that I think we need to consider uh, when it comes to cost. Um, we can figure out for you how much this would cost, uh, but there will be an increase in PO items, right, or items, uh, disposable costs uh, that you'll need to consider if, if this becomes something that is a requirement. And we will be able to customize uh, these as well through the app. Sorry, we have a little delay on slides. Um, the next would be a made-to-order menu. Uh, this is something we've actually already done in our houses. Uh, many of our houses that have, let's say, 60 or fewer members, uh, we've already been offering uh, made-to-order lunches um, and made-to-order breakfast options. Um, and what this is is a predetermined menu. We get with the chapter. We determine, uh, say, a 10 menu item deal for lunch. And that menu can be changed on a regular basis, once a month, once every few weeks. Um, but the students are able to come down and we have some sides, uh, prepackaged sides available for them, uh, some salad items, fresh fruit, things like that they can grab uh, while they're waiting for their food to be prepared. But they essentially come down and say, hey, can I get a cheeseburger today, chef? Uh, hey, can I get chicken tenders and fries today, chef? Um, and so the only downside to this service is there's about, on average, probably about a five minute wait uh, to get your food. But on these chapters where you have a two hour lunch period and you have 50 men who need to eat, there's never more than a couple of men waiting uh, at any given time for lunch, and it really has worked out well, and the men love the customization. So this is something you may wanna consider moving to uh, in the, in the post-COVID world. Kitchen access. Um, this is something we deal with more in fraternities than we do in sororities. Uh, many of our fraternity chapters love to have their access to the kitchen. Uh, they love to be able to get into the kitchen, to cook on the weekends, um, this creates a lot of liabilities anyway. So as a best practice in your kitchen, you really should limit this uh, regardless of COVID. But in the post COVID world, if you've been trying to keep your men out of the kitchen, this is a great time for you to say, hey, this is mandatory now that uh, students are not allowed in the kitchen. Um, and, and this just kind of gives you a good excuse for that. Um, and it really does keep them safer, keep our staff safer um, and keep your food safer as well. When we talk about beverages, I know this will disappoint some people who have spent thousands of dollars on milk machines. Um, it is quite possible that your large beverage machines may not be um, allowed in the short term here following uh, this, this COVID. So we will be looking to move a lot of those bulk beverages to individually packaged beverages. And once again, this will be based on a campus by campus determination of what your local health department is going to allow. Looking at your snack program, many of our snack programs do bulk snacks. So you might take um, you know, pretzels and put them in a big jar or goldfish and put them in a big jar or even cookies in a jar uh, where, where men have access to them. We really need to be thinking about moving to packaged snacks. So snacks that are individually packaged, you can grab, open them up, eat them, throw them away. Um, that's gonna be a major trend and probably oftentimes a requirement uh, from the health department moving forward. The same is gonna be true for things like, um, you know, your 24 seven kitchen. So if you have a kitchenette area outside of your kitchen where students have been able to leave leftovers and, and things of that nature, bulk leftovers, it's a best practice to individually package leftovers for individual people now, as opposed to, let's say we have mashed potatoes left over and we put a pan of mashed potatoes where students can scoop out their mashed potatoes uh, later on that night. That type of idea is probably not gonna be something that health departments are going to like. And so same goes for the student who goes and buys a sandwich um, and brings it back to the house, eats half of it, 
uh, they probably shouldn't stick the other half of the sandwich in the refrigerator anymore. Um, so we kind of need to be monitoring that and thinking about some of these changes to the kitchenette area. Um, and like I said, we're going to have to give suggestions. At the end of the day, it'll be up to our members to actually follow through uh, on these things. Plates and utensils used in this area, uh, it's being recommended by most health departments that we go disposable, especially since the students don't do a very good job of washing these areas in the kitchenette on their own. Late plates will continue, um, and I think late plates will increase. I think that our app usage is going to increase. I think that late plates are going to increase, um, but the bulk leftover containers are going to be eliminated. So I think you're going to see a lot of people who are going to opt to have their, their meals individually placed in late plates. Disposable versus dishware. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, this is a big deal, especially uh, in looking at our dish machines. Uh, making sure we have the proper chemicals on our dish machines, making sure that they've been serviced. Um, if you're an account that, that has us as your provider, we can help you uh, make sure that those get serviced. Um, if you're independent, you need to call Ecolab or call your food service company uh, that, that's helping you, uh, selling you your groceries, your broadline distributor. Sometimes they can help you with this process. But we need to make sure our dish machines are, are really running at optimal um, uh, optimal speed so that the, if we do use real dishes that we're sanitizing those properly uh, in between meals so that they're clean on every use. Uh, for some groups or for some municipalities, it's possible they're going to require everything to be on disposable. So if that's the case, then we need to remember to think about that from a uh, cost perspective, um, that, that there may be some added cost in your uh, house if your health department requires that. So uh, why we do this, um, you know, I think uh, I'll let Shanna, Shanna share as well, but, uh, you know, as a fraternity guy myself, uh, I had terrible food in college, um, and that's why we start, I started this company, was I knew there was a better way, there had to be a better way, um, and my first sales pitch to my first two houses that I had were friends of mine, because I was just out of college, and I said, hey, how's your all's food at your house? And they said, terrible. And I said, okay, here's the deal, you hire me. I will put a chef in your kitchen and I promise you it will not be as bad as it is today. Uh, and, and that was my first sales pitch 10 years ago. Uh, hopefully our sales pitches have improved since then <laughs> as we've really uh, learned this business. But uh, you know, we all do this because we care. We care about these students. We care about Greek life. And in this post COVID world, uh, we're, we are the leaders, you know, on campus. Um, the, the students in your houses, uh, our Greek organizations, uh, these Fijis around the country, uh, your men are leaders. And so I think uh, everyone will be looking for us as a Greek community to step up in the post-COVID world. Um, and I think that is um, something that, that I'm, I'm really looking forward to and will be proud to see uh, is, is how we kind of all come through this uh, together. So we'd love to open this up for any questions uh, that you may have. If you want to email either of us directly, uh, pretty easy, Shanna at UppercrustFoodService.com or Adam at UppercrustFoodService.com. But we just want to thank you for your partnership and thank you for your time. And we will open it up for some questions at this time. I think Dio is going to take it over from here. Perfect. Thank you, Adam and Shana. Uh, a few questions uh, we have for you all tonight. Uh, first, Shana, uh, as far as the gen Generation Z population figures, was that specific to college students, fraternity members, or every male within that age group, or all students within that age group? It is um, more a general of the age group, not a specific on a fraternity, um, you know, the or a specific college. It's just based on that generation and that age group from, you know, being born in 1995. So I think the oldest is now 25. So it's a very general. Perfect, thank you. Uh, just a point of interest, I, I think you'll both, both appreciate this. Um, Brother Paul noted that the greatest generation was hoping that rock and roll was only a fad as well. Uh, you know, and I think 70 years later, it, it kind of proves evidence that fads can turn into trends pretty quick and stick around for a while, which just That's further proves y'all's point. Um, concerning uh, you alls services for upper crust, you know, are, will Upper Crust Food Service employees uh, go through any sort of screening for COVID-19? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So what we are planning to do is we are planning to screen employees for the symptoms uh, of COVID-19. 
Uh, if any of our employees uh, show any of those symptoms, then of course we're going to ask them um, to, we're gonna further investigate that uh, in terms of uh, taking temperature, uh, asking them to go get uh, checked or tested. Um, and of course, if there's any uh, anybody that has any of those symptoms, we're gonna ask them to not be at work until those symptoms subside. One thing that we didn't cover in today's presentation, but that's important to note is that the CDC has come out pretty extensively and said that, you know, this, um, this virus cannot be transmitted uh, by food. And so that is a positive for our kitchens. It needs a living organism, human to human mainly. Um, and and that's, that's an important piece. So if for some reason you had a chef uh, who did show a symptom or maybe they were asymptomatic and had COVID and cooked a meal and your students ate that meal, uh, likely there's not a whole lot of risk to the rest of your chapter because of that. But as soon as we found out, of course, you would want to isolate um, isolate that chef. Of course. Um, kind, of, kind of on that same topic, will Upper Crust Food Service staff be wearing masks? <laughs> we believe that uh, masks are likely the new glove. Um, and uh, so we actually just um, are in the process of ordering as part of our uniforms for next year. Uh, all of our staff will be given um, a mask that has uh, changeable filters. Um, and so that is something that, that we are going to provide. But once again, um, we are not going to mandate the mask unless the chapter, the individual chapter, wants the mask worn or it's mandated by the health department. So in uh, locations where that is not something that is mandated or required or something that the Fiji chapter would like to see, then we're gonna allow our staff to just practice good hygiene and um, you know, operate as, as normal in those areas. But we will have them available in those areas where it's important. Perfect, thank you. Uh, in, in regard to the hygiene aspect, uh, does Upper Crust Food Service have access to CDC and EPA approved cleaning products? So we're actually in the process right now. This has been um, an interesting journey uh, on products um, because as you can imagine, uh, what we're finding right now is everyone who has always ordered masks, gloves, um, cleaning products that are, you know, viricide type cleaning products uh, are places like hospitals and, um, you know, nursing homes, places like that. Well, they're ordering five times as much as they ever have. And now you have everyone who didn't normally order these products are also ordering them. And so what we're finding is there are some supply chain issues, uh, but actually just today I was able to get pricing um, on the majority of the list that we were interested in sharing with our customers. And so we will have a price list available for our customers um, of all of the different PPE items as well as cleaning supplies that we can get access for uh, for you, for your houses. Um, and that will be posted um, on our website. And, and that is a good reference. I don't think we have it on one of our slides, but for anyone watching today that go, goes to our website, which is, you see it on the screen there, uppercrustfoodservice.com. If you do slash COVID, um, that's actually our COVID resource page, and you'll find all kinds of information there, um, additional information, including our post-COVID operational guide. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Adam, Shana, I just want to thank you both for your time tonight. Um, again, brothers, uh, Upper Crust Food Service is the preferred food service provider for Phi Gamma Delta. Um, as well to access that resource, we have uploaded Upper Crust uh, COVID resources to our, our own COVID-19 guidance page. And you'll find that at phigam.org forward slash COVID-19 guidance. Uh, thank you, brothers. Shana, Adam, thank you again for your time. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you.